Good morning. I hope you're all well caffeinated. I think the topic of CBDCs can seem a bit daunting at first, a bit dusty almost. But actually, if you take a look around the world right now, I mean, there's news coming from Russia that they're actually going to roll out a CBDC, the digital ruble, um, by next year um, by the political pressure that is put on them. So I personally don't think that CBDC deserves the, let's say, dusty um, stereotype that it can sometimes be adhered to. And this is what we're here to, to discuss today, amongst other things. But just because we were already on the topic of um, the topic being quite international, just by show of hands, how many of you are actually outside or came in from outside of the Eurozone just for this event right here? Oh, brilliant. Wow. <laughs> That's very good. I'm glad we did this. Wow. Excellent. <laughs> That's impressive. I mean, yeah. for many of you, this must be the first um, time back in Europe as well after COVID. So the world certainly has changed. And as we know, central banks have changed their attitudes towards CBDCs as well in the last couple of years. And this is exactly what we're going to be discussing today. And we have financial, I mean, leaders from financial institutions from um, different European countries in this case right here. But we'll make sure to obviously touch on the developments um, worldwide as well to get the first-hand experience um, on the research that was being done um, in France um, on a CBDC um, for interbank settlement, but then also um, touch on the infrastructure that is used in different countries um, around the world other than the Eurozone um, itself. So as I've said before, um, the keynote panel will um, bring together those, those um, unique um, perspectives from our leaders that are sitting right here next to me, May Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. Great, Hi. great Thank that you are here you. with Thank us. You. Wouldn't call myself a leader, but uh, thank you. That's uh, quite. Uh, <laughs> I just happen to have been looking at uh, blockchain for over five years. Um, in, went of, um, in way of intro, um, I joined the Department of Finance, as I said, exactly five years ago. I started looking at Bitcoin at the time towards Christmas when it was looking at $20,000. Those are the days. Um, it all felt really strange. Um, I just felt that uh, clearly blockchain technology was something that the uh, Minister for Finance in Ireland uh, had to look at. I thought it was going to be transformative. And as I said, we've been looking um, at it and trying to support the department and the development um, internally here in Ireland, but also at a European level. And um, I'm also a member of the OECD um, uh, CMF meeting, where we obviously also look at digital finance. And I was very, very fort fortunate to work with the uh, World Economic Forum um, during COVID, actually, when we spent uh, the guts of uh, 14, 16, 16 months looking at stable coins, and in particular for cross-border payments. So that was very, very good. I hear someone nodding. So um, a very long report, but definitely um, incredible experience, particularly for a dusty um, desk uh, person like me. So yeah, that's, that's my interest in it, and um, why I'm sitting here to, um, with you today. Thank you, May. And we'll touch on the work that you're currently doing um, as well in your position later on, I'm sure. And for now, uh, Nicolas de la Barre, yeah. please also present yourself and your work. So briefly. I'm coming from the centralized world. <laughs> mm -hmm. So as mentioned before, curiosity and challenge drove me to, to work on blockchain. Um, years ago, when we built the Eurozone, uh, we had to build market infrastructures and payment system, which should be uh, resilient, strong, um, so centralized. Then comes the blockchain, and we started experimenting blockchain five years ago, and I'm going to tell about these experiences. Yeah. Perfect. Right before we get started, I'll use the opportunity to also introduce myself. My name is Ferry Palerovic, and I'm from the Digital Euro Association. I'm an executive director there, and the DIA, um, in short, is basically picking up on all the developments um, that the two next to me are are working on on a daily basis, the papers that are coming out, um, seeing where different countries stand, for example, with the CBDC tracker. Um, so we keep a close eye on those developments as well. Now, to get everyone leveled, first of all, let's um, dive into the attitude of uh, Banque de France and possibly also the Bank of Ireland. Um, if you can comment on that, May, that would be great. What general attitude um, do your financial, or does your financial institution um, have toward um, a Eurozone-wide um, CBDC, so one issued by the central bank, and then um, attitude towards um, individual research done by individual countries in the Eurozone. 
So let's start. So we have basically two, two use cases, one for the banks and one for the customers. Maybe we can start with the customers. Um, we see that coins and notes are less used, especially by young people. So we know that we have to move to something new. Uh, so we've been working on a, on a digital euro for all the citizens of Europe. We've been doing it with the ECB because we are part of, this, of a single entity, which is uh, the euro system. Uh, so we are really keen to provide central bank money under the form of tokens that anyone can use in, in its wallets. So we think there is a, a big um, interest for the Eurozone to, 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 to do this move so that we can still use central bank money and the stability of central bank money. Let's start with the retail industry or you want me to touch upon uh, the interbank as well? Let's touch on the retail first yeah. and then you can <laughs> dive in. Go for it, the bank. Go for it, the bank. So for, for the Continue. digital euro, that, that's fine. On the retail, go ahead. I think we're in, we're in that path, no? No, no, for the retail, I just, so you know that we started an investigation phase. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's one year that we have been, been working daily, as you mentioned, on, on, the, on the digital euro. Um, we, we know that, uh, so what we want to, to bring is tokens so that we can still have central bank money in our pocket. But we know that the payment system is um, today mainly managed by commercial uh, money. So we want to find a, a right balance between central bank money and commercial, mm. and commercial money. And the, 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 there are some intensive discussion currently today on, on this, how we can have a system that is uh, co-managed by us and by the commercial banks. This is uh, the, the, the key discussion that we have today. Uh, and we are still discussing on this, so the, the, the updates will come soon on this. Very good. <laughs> on, just on that topic, uh, what's really interesting to see here is obviously um, the Central Bank of, of France um, stands towards CBDCs. We see very different approaches here. Obviously, the Bank of, um, or the Central Bank of Ukraine, for example, they're very okay. inclined to actually use blockchain um, as an infrastructure, whereas the Eurozone, they actually just recently announced that Web3 um, and anything other than person-to-person um, -person, um, transactions are off the table for now, at least, very likely to be. It's yet to be, um, to be decided, finally. Um, but we kind of see very different um, likelihoods of there actually being blockchain as the foundation for the infrastructure. May, if you could give us an update on um, kind of the worldwide developments here, what different approaches do countries in general have towards CBDC? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, what's happening worldwide is, I think it's, um, it's easy to, to spot. Anyone can clearly go to the CBDC tracker, go online, and you can check that out for yourself. So I'm sure you're all more intelligent than I am, particularly when it comes to blockchain. So I will certainly not um, um, try to, to be able to add value to, to that, that you can check yourselves. Um, the value maybe that we try to bring in in financial advisory um, when it comes to developments really is where's the focus is, where's the risk might be, but where's the, the value at? Um, there's 90% of the central banks in the world now looking at CBDCs. Most of, I'd say maybe 70% of the people here have put your hands up to say you come from outside the, uh, the euro area. The Fed just announced late in August that they, um, they're definitely issuing a, 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 a CBDC of sorts, and I'm not talking about a digital dollar a foundation, but something due, and I think they're gonna call it the Fed now, which effectively is your infrastructure. So there's a lot of developments out there. Um, and yet, from a citizen's perspective, and that's me, the normal person, not my work uh, persona looking at this, I'm wondering why would I want this? Um, what's the CBDC gonna change in my life? And how would blockchain actually change my life? And why would I want the central bank change that for me? And I think that's for me when it gets interesting. Um, sometimes it feels the discussion that we're having, and there is development, and we're all looking at it, is we applying blockchain and the application of that um, ability to pay um, to a paper-based process. But we're not using that technology to consider what can we do not just digital, digitalize or digitalizing that paper exchange, but what else could we potentially do that right now we're not even considering? And I think that's where the, um, 
the discussion, it's missed. Um, we can all obviously go in and eventually the technology will allow us to just digitalize that payment that, you know, between you and me or between banks or between even central banks, which is something I'd love to explore um, in a wider, in a wider uh, setting perhaps. But are there other uses we could do with that CBDC that just matches the payment? It just feels we're not giving credit to what the technology can do. And I'm looking at you because you guys are the experts, um, particularly knowing what Hyperledger can do. So could we use a, a retail CBDC for, I don't know, lifting the, the, um, the, the hardship of having to pay taxes? What if taxes could actually be uh, deducted through programmability at the point of payment, as an example? That to me is where we're missing the point. We have an incredible um, opportunity to reconsider clearly how we um, digitalize that, as I said, this payment, this paper trail that we're doing, but we're just, we're just too focused on that. And I think it'd be great to do um, a bit more sky, blue sky thinking in terms of what the technology uh, and the opportunities will bring to us. There's many of them. Um, I mean, I know you guys coming in from a hyperledger form perspective um, in the CBDC discussions and the and the pilots that um, Nicholas had mentioned, for example, in and bringing in the work that we did at the WF, the Sustainable Development Goal number ten is about reduce, well, sorry, effectively reducing the inequality in humankind, and specifically there is a goal there to re decrease transaction costs like remittance costs to 3% for Im immigrants and effectively erode all corridors or all um, remittance corridors that charge more than 5%. During COVID time, in European countries, some European countries, transaction costs, this is payment, like all of these countries, all of you guys here, here, I don't know how much you're getting charged now to come here and get your, 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 your euro payments. But in a lot of countries in the world during COVID, remittance costs and transaction costs actually went up as digital payments went up. So could CBDC ap ap address that and at the same time address the SG SDG goal number 10 and at the, S at the same time address that inequality? Um, those are the questions that I think we're, we're missing sometimes just looking at, at retail CBDC. Uh, just one more. I fully agree that we define some priorities, but I fully agree that we might still be open to many, many, many use cases. So we didn't decide yet which would be the first use cases. So there would be surprises. <laughs> which will be the first use cases in terms of the goals for a CBDC, especially, yeah. I mean, now you've talked about the retail one and then there's also the interbank settlement. Could you just briefly um, take us through the objectives for both of these, for the Banque de France? So Interbank was mainly driven by our customers, uh, meaning that we have customers with other banks, which are now paying in central bank money. They see a use case to uh, issue tokens, uh, security, security tokens. And so they want uh, to have central bank money for paying this, uh, this security token. So this is uh, the first UK use case. They, they, they think that it would be much easier to issue tokens with uh, DLT to sell it around the world. Uh, it will be much quicker than today, so they see a real use cases, and we have been issuing some security tokens together with them. And we had central bank money to, to pay this uh, security token. So this is the first use case. Then we have the second use case, which is close to what you mentioned, which is the cross-border payments. We know that the industry here is not efficient. Uh, the issue is that we need to all build this uh, new system around the world. I don't know whether we will, be, we will have only one unique uh, cross-border um, payment versus payment uh, use case, or whether we will have a network of regional networks, but we will do something, and we are experimenting with uh, Singapore, with other central banks in the world, uh, the Switzerland as well. So this is, these are the two use cases which are driven by your customers, and we, we want to provide uh, cash on the ledger to these, uh, to these use cases. I think it's great to hear. Um, I think use cases are there, technology is there to be used uh, and to be applied. And you know, we obviously want to, be, to, to use that experience and, and that brain and that innovation to, to apply it to things. Um, again, from, our, from, from the angle that we look at in terms of looking at possibilities but also risks, 
um, technology implementation, all technology implementation is going to fail unless there's uptake and acceptance by the U, the U and me. I mean, who remembers the mini discs, right? I mean, we just went straight from, from CDs to um, sh even shuffles. I mean, although it did, a, it did bring up um, a need for a shuffling song than uh, to a Spotify. But um, the point is, with that acceptance, um, you know, it's the best, I think, structured, defined, designed CBDC retail CBDC in the world. It's not going to work. And at the same time, with that trust, it's not going to work. Um, and you know, we unfortunately we were, we didn't have a chance to have um, a representative here from the Central Bank of, of Nigeria. But would it be great to actually hear how's that worked? Um, but what's the acceptance of the usage? Because in some of those pilots for central banks outside of Europe, um, they citizens have not been that willing to accept it because they don't trust their central bank. This is something that ours in Europe just take for granted. We, take, we tend to trust our central bank. Um, but what happens in a particular country where that trust is not there? Because at the end of the day, you're just digital, digitalizing. It's such a different word, difficult word, uh, but you know what I mean. Um, what we're doing is with the paper, now we're doing it with a digital currency, right? So without that trust, it's not going to work. Um, and likewise, um, in terms of, of that design, it needs to be easy to work. We just take it for granted. Again, we have smartphones. We don't have even just feature phones or of, of dumb phones, but you need access to the internet. We talked about, do we need a QR code? Do we need to have a, a digital year that's, that's offline? The reality in terms of how um, citizens would accept that and then use it, because it needs to be easy. You know, at the end of the day, it's easier just to take a $100 bill out of your back note than having to go in and log in and blah, 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 and whatever it is that you have to do. So there's a lot of elements out there that I think that are really important to be mindful of. And sometimes, again, um, we tend to forget because we just see it from our perspective. And I guess this is something I wanted to share with you from a hyperledger perspective because you obviously have a global view. So with that specific country experience and knowing or understanding what the citizens want, what's going to work for them, what the central bank is in relation to that particular country's citizenship, if you were to actually offer that hyperledger solution in terms of technology, what's the angle that you need to play? That's probably what I think it would be of interest to you. So to reiterate, you're talking about user experience on the one hand needing to be easy, uh, which is also very much in line with what we think at the Digital Hero Association. Um, and then secondly, uh, what you were touching on um, as well is basically uh, the, the acceptance there needs to be a clear advantage in using a CBDC as opposed to different types of money. We see it in Sweden with Swish, we see yeah. it in Germany with, with uh, PayPal, I can't speak to other European countries, what it's like there. Um, but that needs to be clear and I think one of the ways in which this can be achieved is um, blockchain as a foundation, um, like you, you were saying, micropayments um, enabling, um, or right now we have the, uh, the money that you get once off for the rising energy prices, which is a political measure mm -hmm. um, to, to help people um, that need the money to actually pay for, for gas becoming more expensive, for example. So this is, for example, something that could come in handy because right now right. more is spent in bureaucracy um, around those payments than is being paid out to the citizens, yeah. to name one real life example. And this is just one example of kind of what you can learn along the way, I guess, or what, what we will learn along the way. And um, Nicholas, what's your stance on this? Is there anything that you've learned um, in the last couple of years when it comes to your CBDC use cases that you can already derive from? You're saying you're doing things differently. Um, this is how it will impact the, the future um, research and roadmap rollout. Uh, I would like to come back to the challenges you mentioned because one you didn't mention was confidentiality. Of course. Yeah. Um, see, yeah, that was the first goal we had yeah. to, 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 to check whether we could manage confidentiality within this, mm -hmm. uh, this blockchain application. Well, and for sure. Yeah, yeah, because uh, <laughs> I, I mean, people, people don't want to know how they are using their money. I mean, yeah. we, we already saw it for the COVID, they didn't want yeah. to be tracked and so on. But uh, for sure, if we want to manage the system, we, we, we need to supervise them in, in some way, but we need to manage confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Um, that was uh, 
one of the key uh, elements we, we, we discovered was doable uh, with the hyperledger fabric. Uh, previously, we mentioned some uh, challenges on interoperability and um, uh, as uh, was said, uh, the, the system will not be independent from all the other systems, so we need to be interoperable Absolutely. For, for sure. The, the um, ecological footprint, of course, is, uh, is something important for us. We, we've been working intensively as well on, on, this, uh, on these things. Uh, we need to work as well on performance, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. This is um, maybe for, not for all the use cases, but for the retail, we, we will need to, to work on this. Uh, you sp someone spoke about the U.S. project. Uh, this was clearly one, one of the targets they had. So we need to work on performance. And you mentioned briefly the, ho the offline, which was uh, clear for Nigeria to, to, to be put in place. Uh, here, the, the, the work we've been doing shows that it's not fully uh, reliable today. Mm -hmm. And for sure, the digital euro needs to be reliable. So the, the, the offline needs to be secure. Uh, and not double spent and so on. So, so this is uh, one of the, these are the challenges we still need to face. So we've learned part of these things, but uh, we still need to, to achieve. Um, maybe just I'm constant, uh, conscious of the red light um, flashing there as well. Um, Sarah, you mentioned that the, uh, somehow the digital euro would have to be, um, there have to be a benefit to using that. Um, and, and specifically, we're talking about digital euro here. I'm not talking about potentially what would be another city in another country. But I would challenge that, and I would say, why do we have to have a preference, or why would it have to be above anybody else? Um, the reason I'm saying that is because when we approach payments, the way I'd like to approach it is a little bit like modes of transports, right? For long distances, you, you use planes. Um, just to go down the road, you might use a skateboard, now an electric one. Uh, you might go to the bicycle, you might use the bus. There's different choices depending on what you can afford because of the distance and so forth. Why can't we have different ways of payments irrespective, or sorry, not irrespective, why don't we have different pay payments actually respective, as in depending on the transaction, the cost, the medium. And that, I think, where is the value of, of uh, CBDC is. It might actually allow for the government to dive and to literally pay out certain things, it doesn't mean that maybe the citizens will want to use that for our day-to-day -day payments. So that's where I think there's, there's, there's a lot of scope and room for us to be a lot more groundbreaking and innovative and actually really consider how we could use a CBDC. Because there's a lot more we can do. We're just limiting ourselves with just the data in being prepared. That's what I think. One element you didn't mention is that we have a certain stability in Europe since a long time. Um, maybe people do not see the risk uh, in uh, using such a, or such a mean to pay. Uh, we want to bring stability to this, uh, to this world. So the, the you have to take as well into consideration things that are not so clear yep. in some of the means you, you are using. So that's, <laughs> yep. that's why we're doing this project to keep this stability that we have in Europe. Thank you. Another one of your, of your goals basically. Um, in the approach that you're taking right now. Just um, in terms of being wary of, of time, um, <laughs> we will just do one round of closing statements here on what you think the ecosystem needs in terms of, of, govern, uh, of, of government, um, technology providers, um, policy right now. Let's focus on the, on the Eurozone um, for this question. Um, I don't know with what to start. F for policy, we will have a pilot regime in the next years, so we will experiment different policies. So we know, we know that we, it will evolve. Technology, I mentioned offline, because we, we need to, to, I mean, you, you, have, you may have to pay without your phone in your hands. Um, in terms of government, I would say, um, all the things we have said about uh, confidentiality and so on to, to, to work on this so that the people can really trust the, the digital euro. Maybe you have more elements on this, <laughs> on the policy side. Yeah, I mean, on the policy side, I, I think it's great that we're even looking at CBDCs. Um, we wouldn't be looking at them if it hadn't been, I think, because of Libra um, in June 2019, and that's the reality of it. Um, 
and this means you can walk into a room, a policymaker or a minister or even the central bank here in Ireland, and we're talking about blockchain, which was impossible two, three years ago. And that's a reality of it. So I think the more of that, I think it's great. Um, it needs to be understanding, not just fearing it, and that takes with a lot of um, meetings and explanations and presentations, and that's the work that unfortunately, you know, people like we, we have to do, but it has to be done, because if you don't understand something, you can't possibly bring it into your day-to-day -day job. I mean, how can you possibly end up with the right policy if you don't understand or at least comprehend what a technology can do and cannot do? So I, I think that, that to me is going to be key. Personally, again, from a policymaker perspective, I think understanding the risks or where the focus is is key because otherwise you just end up with the wrong regulation or the not fit for purpose regulation or the wrong policy. And again, that, that comes with understanding and asking questions. So uh, if there's anyone here that um, wants to meet up after and just uh, give me a, an update on CBDCs and Apple Ledger, I'm always willing to learn because uh, that's where really where I get, I get my understanding from. I think you're speaking for all of us here. I was just going to mention that as well. Please do keep the conversation going. I'm happy to to meet uh, all of those that are interested, that have updates, um, that want to learn more about Hyperledger um, as an infrastructure, for example, um, and then uh, keep the discussion going. As you said, keep educating and uh, holding presentations one-on-one uh, -on -one in this case. Hope you have a good rest of, of the uh, summit of, of today's day. Um, and looking forward to the discussions. Thank you.